Well, we have a rather curious subject today, but one that seemingly is involved in practically everything that happens on earth, and that is the human mind. There are no adequate definitions as to what the mind is, but there is a reasonable accumulation of data concerning what the mind does. And under careful scrutiny, it is obvious that the mental equipment is definitely a mixed blessing. Now, why is the mind what it is? Well, it is part of a general government, collective and individual. The world is governed by attitudes, convictions, beliefs, opinions, and various research projects. And these, most of them, originate in the mind. The individual is governed by his own mental equipment, which he very seldom questions for the simple reason he has nothing to question the mind with except the mind. He has to analyze the thinking equipment. And of course, for some unknown reason, the mind nearly always wins the argument. It does what it wants to do. Now, the mind as general commander-in-chief of the body is controlling a complete miniature empire, which we call the human being. This empire can includes every type of life that is found in the larger theater of the world around us. This empire within us has its continents, its races, it has its arts and sciences, it has its transportations, and its own educational theories. It is a complete world, living and existing on three distinct levels. These levels are for the most part obvious, recognized, and in one way or another, misused. The physical body is the final uh, basis of the human personal integration. This might generally and is generally considered a kind of blue-collar structure. It is here to work. It is to, here to do what the mind and the emotions want it to do. And the fact that the mind and emotions may not be very good about their own desires, this the body has to stand. The body has to accept the domination of superior instruments which are often dishonorable. So the body has to do what we want it to do. If we want it to uh, be up and on its feet, it stays there until it falls of fatigue. The body has no recourse to anything below itself. It has to accept the final slavery imposed upon it by the mind and emotions. Now, if we didn't have a mind and did not possess emotions, the body would probably be inert and useless. The body of its own accord would be simply a creature seeking food seeking to survive, but with no particular purpose or project in mind. The body is not an executive, but it is the victim of the large executive factions upstairs. And in this situation, the body is nearly always ignored. It has not any rights. But like labor, which is the great collective body in society, it has one power that cannot be denied. It has the right to strike. And the physical body makes use of this occasionally. When it has had enough of something, it simply announces displeasure. This announcement is accompanied by discomfort. And if the situation is too serious, the body may be subject to fatal consequences. The body, however, can revolt against the domination of that which is above itself. Actually, of course, there should be no need for such a revolt, because the superior part of man should respect the body, should realize that this structure is a commonwealth, 
that it has its obligations, its duties, and at the same time confers definite benefits upon the personality which it is, it is motivating. So the body can object. And when it objects, what do we do with it? Well, in labor, when labor objects, we put in a few strike breakers to force them back into line. Well, when the physical body shows wear and tear, we do something to keep it going, but not for the primary purpose of making it healthy or happy. It's merely to keep it doing what we want it to do. And when the body no longer does what we want it to do, we wake up in a rather sad state. So we have a body physically that is subject to the tyrannies of both emotion and thought. Emotion stirs up things, gets the body into all kinds of difficult situations, presses various temperamental excesses which damage the structure and function of the body. The emotions of hate are just exactly as bad on the body as a, a poison gas. All the things that we do emotionally that are destructive injure the body. The idea that we can have a strong body and perverted emotions is simply unrealistic. But then most of our attitudes are unrealistic because we base them upon what we want to do rather than what we should do. Now the emotional pressures against the physical body can result in a variety of ailments which are now generally recognized and are being studied. And these studies are very largely limited to psychoanalysis and matters of this nature. Actually, the emotions are also depleting and debilitating the physical body. They are adding to its wear and tear. They are struggling to preserve their own purposes. What the emotions want, desire being one of the most prominent of the emotional functions, what they want, they demand, and there is no consideration for the consequences. We see this today in alcoholism, where the emotion, the mental nature, has condoned the use of alcohol, wishes to use it to inspire a certain confidence or to build a certain sense of joviality, and the body is the sufferer. The body has nothing to resort to as a means of getting out of the situation, but if the emotions and mind are too despotic, we will have delirium tremens, which will put the individual into a very bad state, if not an early grave. So what we want to do, seldom if ever, is based upon a concept of what is good for and what is best with the problems of the human body. Actually, therefore, we have to arrange in thinking that we have a neglected factor which all the doctors in the world have not been able uh, to really keep going. The Chinese probably did the best of any up to the present time. Uh, the uh, Chinese people hire a doctor when they are healthy and well, and they do not pay him if they get sick. Uh, this is the exact opposite of our method, but there is something more to it also. The doctor is therefore going to do everything possible to keep them well. He is going to move in and teach the individual the laws of living. In Chinese culture, the medical practitioner is usually a Taoist philosopher. He is capable of many types of magic, esoteric healing, and things of this nature unknown to us in the West, and of course he has given us acupuncture and, and a variety of pharmaceuticals. But this Chinese doctor's idea is that if he takes the job, which he can refuse if he doesn't want to take it, then he expects the person he is keeping well to be a basically enlightened Confucianist. The individual who wants to stay well must become aware of the responsibilities of the superior person. The only way to stay well is to keep right. Now there are of course accidents and things of this nature 
which we cannot include, but the run and file of people who have no great special tragedy in their lives, drift along without the proper amount of Confucianistic discipline. The doctor, therefore, reminds them that the superior person is the only individual who has the right to be healthy. An individual who doesn't keep the rules of life doesn't have any right to have a healthy body. He does not have any right to have a happy and comfortable relationship with his own physical structure. The moment he breaks the rules physically, which he does because of mental and emotional pressure, the body suffers. And if this goes on long enough, the Chinese physician must point out that the individual trying to do what he pleases rather than what he should is shortening his life and, dep and depressing his own uh, actions and cultures. So, the health began in China with being right. And it is simply true here. But how do you become right? This is another problem. Well, there is the first positive use of the mind. The mind, being the uh, general in charge of the entire corporation, has a right to be heard and has the inevitable right to be right. Now, why is the mind not always right? Well, because we've never trained it properly. We haven't realized that the mind is probably the most important vehicle that we have in the process of living. We are doing all kinds of things with the mind, but most of the things we do are prejudicing it in one way or another. We want the mind to be the means of fulfilling everything in life that we desire. A mind that doesn't fulfill our wishes isn't much of an intellect as far as we are concerned. A mind that tells us to be temperate brings immediate objection. And what, what is the source of the objection? A counter-attitude of the mind itself. So the mind that gets us into trouble, the mind that gets us out of trouble, and the mind that keeps us alternating between one and the other for most of our lifetime, all this is one mysterious instrument that has the authority to over-influence the life of the person. The mind working in harmony with the emotions and protecting the rights of the body will represents the best form of government that the human being can have. The mind, therefore, must be taught how to govern. And the, and the results of its own instruction are proven by the emotional and physical consequences of thought. If the mind is right, the body will be reasonably well, and the emotions will be stable. If the mind loses its own integration, or fails to maintain its proper relation with life, then the other two factors are immediately sickened. And we find that most of our thoughts these days have a tendency to deplete health or depress emotions. The world we live in today is a world which many people fear. They believe that the inevitable consequences of our mistakes must sometime descend upon us. But we seldom apply this to ourselves. We seldom think that the personal mistakes that we make every day are really going to be held against us. We feel, as far as that's concerned, that there are a lot of little things that God and nature have to overlook because we are not perfect after all. Well, no one really expects us to be perfect, but nature expects us to do a little better than the average person does. We are supposed to cooperate mentally and in so doing not only preserve the harmony of our own compound construction, but also to protect the world in which we live. Selfishness and cupidity and arrogance and all these bad motion, emotional mental processes are destroying our planet. And the very po policies which are wrecking the planet are held in the minds of people who are wrecking themselves by having those habits. This is something that's hard to believe, perhaps, but if we want to know what is happening and why it is happening, it is not necessary to climb the smoky sides of Sinai. It is only necessary to sit down quietly 
and reflect for a few moments upon the conditions of society, our own personal lives, and the attitudes by which we are dominated. If we do this, we will soon have the answer to most of the common questions. Now in China, as we aforementioned, uh, the doctrines of Confucius, though for a time outlawed by Mr. Mao, are now back in fashion. And it is now considered a part of education for the individual to realize that an education that enables him to be sick, poor, discontented, and driven by dictatorships is not much of an education. And the world isn't going to get very far on that diet of culture. Wherever we find things wrong, there is some kind of ignorance. And this ignorance is either natural or acquired. Natural ignorance you can do something with. Acquired is more difficult. Acquired ignorance lies, uh, largely arises from the individual's personal determination to break rules for his own benefit, failing to realize that this is utterly impossible. When he thinks he has broken some rule for his own benefit, he is simply laying up trouble, trouble for the future. There's no way of escaping it. So that the end of education, theoretically, is to produce the superior person. Now, superiority is not a standard factor. Superiority is actually the individual living from the best part of himself. It is the individual using the talents that he possesses as wisely and friend in such friendliness as is possible. The superior person is the one who lives according to the highest concepts of his own character, conduct, or background. There is no reason why a superior person has to be a genius. Many geniuses are hopelessly unbalanced. But a superior person must have the fundamentals of a civilized human being. Now, in order to have those fundamentals, something has to be done with the intellect, the mind which is hard to harness, the mind which is constantly resisting law and order, the mind which is concerned only in the fulfillment of ambitions and has very little time or thought for self-improvement. So the only way you can do anything with the mind is to get it young and stay with it until you make it do the things that it is supposed to do. This is a, a different approach to education from what we have now. What we are really now trying to do is help the mind to be sneaky and safe at the same time. We expect the mind to break the rules and live happily ever afterwards. And in order to convince us of this, it has rearranged the rules so that the mind is miseducated to go on and perpetuate the sorrows and miseries of the human race. So the Confucianist decided that the main point was to find out as far as we can what constitutes superiority. For superiority, when it is properly acquired, lifts the individual from a previous level of inadequacy. Superiority is not an ultimate in itself by one grand dash towards uh, education. Superiority is a constant growing in which the individual constantly lives above his own mistakes and corrects them and does all that he can to advance his life. This is what we should have in school. The mind should be taught that the most important thing is that it should be a benevolent uh, organizer and a benevolent executive. It is like a country. The country has a good ruler, the people flourish. If it has a bad ruler, they suffer. If the ruler is ambitious, runs them into wars, debt, and revolution, the same thing happens in the human body. The sick is sets in and there is no immediate cure for it. So the Confucius said, Confucian says, let's start by diagnosing the requirements of a superior person. Now most people think they're superior. And even when they know they're not, they don't want anyone else to tell them so. Because there's certain pride in there also. We wish to be a success. 
and as we have set up a science of success as a result of breaking rules, we can break a few of them, and then the rules break us. So the Chinese says the first thing you have to do to teach the child is to give it the integrity necessary to develop into a purposeful person, a person who is superior. Now, what is a superior person? A superior person is one who is above committing inferior deeds. Anything that is destructive, anything that is selfish, anything that damages the public good or the private good must be considered as against the production of the superior person. The superior person must be a builder, not a wrecker. The superior person must put others before himself. He must recognize genius where it exists. He must serve integrity where he finds it. And in his personal life, he must keep the rules of the Confucian Code. And the Confucian Code is one of the earliest of the various world codes to include the statement that we should do unto others as we would wish that they would do unto us. It was integrity from the beginning. So the first step of education is to teach an individual what honesty is, why it is worthwhile, and why he must acquire it if he wishes to be happy. Now he may find that he is surrounded by people who do not agree with this. And as we are likely to follow the leaders of our day, we soon lose sight of the problems of being superior, and very often end up by being inferior to the worst rather than superior to the best. So superiority includes a complete development of mental integration, a mind that in judgment is honest, a mind that is fair, a mind that is humane, a mind that is not self-centered to the degree that it will injure others to advance its own cause, a mind that is honest, is dedicated to purposes, and is a watchful and loving guardian of the emotional levels of the body and form, which we call human, and the larger emotional and physical body, which we call population. All of these things are part of a code, and the mind was given to us so that we can live well, do right, and be happy. What happened to it? Something went wrong because we are none of these things today. We are frightened, we are selfish, we are dishonorable, we are out to one purpose only, and that is to get ahead by cheating somebody else if necessary, and our idea of the superior person is the individual who in one way or another has accumulated wealth or power and very difficult to collect either in large quantities without compromising principles. So the child in school has to start with the culturing of its mind. Now education generally has never been very successful in culturing the mind. Most educational systems have been set up in countries, nations, and times in which corruption was common and prevalent. And education has gradually become a means of competing with that which is wrong. The mind has been taught to be more cunning than the mind of the neighbor. And the mind of the whole world is settled upon aggrandizement, upon domination, and upon conquest. All of these things are silly, stupid, and mortally dangerous. Now we can believe, for instance, that we go along in our own personal lives and that um, the mind is a fairly pleasant person to be with. It thinks not a nice thoughts as long as they're not very important thoughts. But where something very important comes up, the mind retires into its own pattern of exclusiveness and decides what it's going to do regardless to whether it's right or wrong. Now, a mind that is educated by television isn't in very good shape. A mind that depends upon the daily press for its cum laude is not in good shape either. The actually, the mind today is exposed to a system which is very detrimental, but is not likely to admit the fact that it is responsible for the system. 
We have a vicious circle here. By wrong thinking, we build a great empire, which we have to per perpetuate by more wrong thinking. And in the long run, this empire collapses because it was wrong, and the thinking has not been able to take over sufficiently, honorably, to call the, to call the situation normal. It is normal. So we have to find out now how to work into this situation. And uh, Taoism is a good way. We've got a group of meditation uh, philosophies at the present moment that are gaining wide attention. People meditating on what? This is the big question. Meditation is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't get us anywhere unless it re-educates the mind. It cannot simply ignore the mind and keep on having bad habits and good thoughts. The policy won't work. We have to gradually find ways in meditation to get this meditative mood into the intellectual nature firmly enough so that the mind begins to correct its own mistakes rather than making more. The mind is a creature that can correct its own mistakes, but it seldom does so, because by the time the mistakes have been made and have been uncomfortably assimilated into conduct, the mind is not likely to change them. If it could change them, it would do so in the world also, and we would not at the end of 5,000 years of so-called civilization, have, have, we won't have passed as we have now through the post-war years of a struggle which cost the lives of nearly 60 million human beings for no good whatever. Even the old boundaries haven't changed. The old grievances haven't changed. The old hopes have not been stimulated. The old faults have not been corrected. So what was the result of all this? A mental attitude, which was wrong. This attitude held maybe by leaders at one time and by ambitious followers at another or by hopeless persons who could make no contribution because they had never trained themselves to, to follow an internal conviction. So here we have this mind that is constantly a powerhouse and is constantly suffering from wrong behavior patterns. The first thing, perhaps, that we have to learn to do with the mind before we can get it anywhere is to gradually break down its sense of omnipotence. The individual who finally reaches a point where he can look at himself and say, I was wrong, and mean it, is simply saying, my mind betrayed me. When an individual can say, I should have done it a different way, which would have been better. But we didn't do it that different way. Again, the mind is responsible, for it has lured us on to the perpetuation of a mistake. If we want to find out the cause of broken homes, of bankruptcies, of narcotics and crime, of moral delinquency and political tyranny, we have to go back to the mind box, for that is the box from which all of Pandora's difficulties come forth. Every problem we have is from the mind, and every uh, cure we have ever tried to make was also from the mind. So these uh, processes are locked in a tyranny in which gradually appetites, which are natural to immature persons, take precedence and we live to cater to our feelings rather than to our facts. We continue to break rules because we find a certain immediate satisfaction and then wake up someday faced with a huge penalty which we are unable to meet. So the great problem is to use the mind. In India it is said in the Bhagavad Gita that the mind is the slayer of the real. And yet we were not given a mind by the divine power because it slew things. We are not given the mind because we don't need it. It is part of the compound of created things. And this compound is bestowed by a wisdom far greater than our own. It comes from a source of life which has decided that 
to think is one of the important processes of growth. So we have to go into the problem of thinking and try to decide what is a thought and what is an opinion. What is a fact and what is a fable? How are we going to prove to our own satisfaction that things that are wrong will not be righted merely by perpetuating them? Well, the thoughtful person uh, sits down like Omar the tent maker and begins to contemplate these matters and can get a liberal education very quickly. Because when one country invades another, and when the Iranians attack the Iraqis, the same thing is happening inside ourselves on a smaller scale. We are opposing, attacking, uh, incapacitating elements of our own temperaments in an effort to attain some kind of an unreasonable sovereignty of a part over the whole. Actually, all nature is asking of man is that he will use his compound temperament, disposition, and integration to advance the common good of himself and others of his kind. The parts of man must work together, or there is some kind of a war in the body. The nations of society must work together, for tyranny will ultimately destroy society. So we have the human body as a miniature for all the processes that are going on around us in society. That we can learn from this is obvious. The only thing we need to do is think about it. In other words, we can begin to use the mind to solve its own mistakes. And this is a, more or less a sheer genius. But it was something we were intended to do. It is not unreasonable. It is not a fantastic uh, impossible that we can never hope to accomplish. Many serious, thoughtful people can accomplish it if they want to. And as a few in, uh, do, uh, do improve, the majority will follow, will follow to some degree. So as we sit around and watch all these things that are happening, some people will turn on the t news reels, news on the t television, listen and say, oh, it's all terrible. Others will turn it off because they don't want to hear it. A third group does not believe a word of it. And the, still another group is fighting to some political purpose which it has assumed to be significant. All of these things are a great expenditure of energy and nothing to help the mind. Most people in thinking feed the mind on junk foods and as a result of that it brings out some very junky decisions <laughs> which are not necessary, inevitable or useful. If, however, we really want to start a little thinking, there's plenty of it here to do, plenty of chance to do it. But decisions have to be made. There are penalties or prices upon everything in nature. Uh, the penalty for a misdeed is misery. The price of a good deed is intelligence. The individual must use the faculties that he has the way they were intended to be used if he expects to benefit from them. There is no one who is any better off by being completely under the tyranny of his own intellect or of a collective group of intellects. A whole group of people coming to wrong decisions does not result in a correct decision. In this case, the majority is not always right. The majority is not right now because the majority doesn't think at all or is so selfish and self-centered that it doesn't care. So we start in by deciding that the mind is a potential savior the energies of which are being ruthlessly wasted. Now, how do we try to do this? Well, there are two ways. We must ultimately, of course, work it into our educational system. We must begin to train the mind to think and not to inherit the notions of other people. We have to train the mind to contribute to the future rather than build all of its wealth and strength upon the past. The past is important, but only to the degree it gives us true insights into the repetition of ancient policies. So we have to start in either by going to school in a different type of educational theory, more like that of Comenius, who gave us the public school in the beginning 
uh, but unfortunately died too soon, about 300 years too soon, to, have it, to be able to control the system after it passed out of his keeping. Comenius was very simple in his ideas. He says it's very easy to over-educate people. When you over-educate a person above his and beyond his capacities, you have a, a mis misfortune and a, a dis desperately unhappy person. So education should be appropriate to the needs. And education should begin always in moral instruction. It should begin by a proper use of emotion as a curb upon thought. If the emotions of charity, love, piety, faith, and all of the kindlier feelings, if these emotions are cultivated constructively, they can definitely interest, influence the mind. The mind can be changed by the use of other faculties which man possesses. Also, the mind can be altered considerably by the physical body, because after a while the mistakes of the mind show up there in terms that cannot be contradicted. So the mind has to gradually realize that it is not the Lord of all it surveys, that it cannot do anything that it wants to do and not be punished. The mind must come to the realization that it exists primarily to learn what is right and do it. Now this does not mean that life is going to become a dull monotony or that for lack of mistakes we have nothing to live for. It is because of the fact that the values, joys, securities and the wonderful internal experiences of being right are more lasting and more satisfying than the result of any vice that can be cultivated. So we can hope that people will quietly sit down and begin looking around them and looking within them. Looking around to see what's the matter with the families around them, what's the matter with the business that is falling apart, why they can't speak to their relatives anymore, why their children are delinquent, all these things they can notice. And they can also do what a number of groups are doing now, organizing themselves against these delinquencies. It is becoming more and more obvious uh, that bad habits are endangering the survival of civilization. Well, bad habits are simply basically me bad mental attitudes, wrong thinking wrong decisions about what is good and what is bad. Now, a lot of people say that we already have this information. We do. There are very few people in this world who do not know right from wrong. But they do have other pressures that are stronger. Instead of being concerned with uh, right and wrong, they are concerned with what they want, what they wish to do. If it's revenge, they want to have it. If it's some kind of argument, they want to enjoy it. And they feel perfectly right and free to elect the wrong persons to public office. These things are not part of the discipline that we need, but they are coming out all around us. What we need is more and more thoughtfulness. The education of the mind in realities. The education of the mind that when it says, I think I will t go out and buy some cocaine, Immediately, the mind itself says, no, you don't, because you can see, know, hear, read, and observe the consequences of such a conduct. There is no law that says that you have to be a narcotics addict. The only reason is that because it gives you a temporary feeling of omniscience. You suddenly feel you are bigger than anybody else, but you suddenly realize that you are smaller than most people by the time it's over. There is no advancement, but we do it. So the mind says, let's go out and buy this material, or go into bankruptcy trying to pay for it. Now, all this is not the result of a bad mind. It is the result of a bad use of a potentially good mind. Or perhaps it is calling upon more strength of character than we possess. But if we haven't got the strength of character, the mind will bill it for us, if we are willing to accept. So the mind can pick out every fault that there is in society today and finally add to it the consequence of 
the fact that we personally are committing these faults and it's all being shown to us clearly through arteriosclerosis and other symptoms of bodily distress. We are actually a single creature. Our thoughts, our emotions, and our bodies are part of one entity. And when we shortchange any of the parts, the whole suffers. The same with a nation. A nation that is well governed must consider all the needs of all the people. It must defend itself against the extravagances of some individuals who wish to break faith with the integrities of life. Same with the person. When we are ready to break faith with integrity, we are on our way to all kinds of difficulties. Now, most people are not such marvelous, terribly important people that they can necessarily worry too much about some of these problems. What they really need to do is to get down to the small things of life and try to work them out. In our own little way, we have headaches dyspepsia, indigestion. Anison and its byproducts, largest selling drug in the United States because it is a treatment for a headache. Now headaches are sometimes legitimate, but more often misconduct is the basis of headaches. The individual with a headache is the one who is worried when he should have thought. An individual who ate when he should not have eaten. An individual who got into an argument that he should not have gotten into. Or have all kinds of negative, destructive fears, anxieties, worries, and antagonisms until he gets so miserable that he has to take some more aspirin. Now aspirin is not a cure for anything. It reduces symptoms for a little bit. But the only cure for the difficulties that aspirin is taken for is clear thinking. The individual, by thinking himself through this maze of his own misconducts, can find a way to remove most of his headaches. Those that remain may represent need of personal, of medical or psychological attention. The individual may have to go down as far as his diet in order to find the roots of some of his headaches. But most of his headaches come from above, because the headache, as is implied, is in the head. And it's in the head where the headache arises in the mind. Now, the brain is not responsible. That poor little hunk of flesh is just doing the best it can. It has been given over to the custody of a heartless taskmaster. It is a slave to the will of the mind behind it. It has nothing to do or nothing to say but to transmit the impulses, good or bad, uh, to the, some other part of the body that is being affected or they hope will be affected. So there is no way out of this unless the individual realizes that the mind has as its primary purpose not ingenuity but integrity. We think the mind is a great thing these days when it invents a computer. That really is the answer. Already people don't know what to do with them. The problem of computers is already assuming gigantic proportions. Another individual might point out that we are indebted to the mind for putting a man on the moon. Yeah, it's probably true. The mind was having a grand time on its own, with no consideration for the rest of the body which belongs to it. Uh, the uh, landing the man on the moon was a scientific achievement. But the real problems of life were not touched by it. They then decided they'd land one on Mars. They can go on until they land one in the Milky Way, but it still will not prevent the common mistakes we make here every day. It's to correct the immediate mistakes. We look down on them. They're inconsiderable. What is the use of not being selfish when with a little effort you can make a neutron bomb? This is the difference of perspective. It is the fact the individual wants anything that takes the mind away from his own need to grow. He wants to be amused. If he has wealth, he spends it recklessly. If he has poverty, he gets what he can by any means possible. 
But with all of that, the mind, instead of being the leader of a marvelous organization of faculties, is simply catering. And actually, as strange as it may, not, it may seem, the mind isn't particularly pleased over all this. The mind isn't happy and jolly as the result of all kinds of bad decisions that it inspires. It is worried to death. The mind is just as unhappy as the person who has it in his head at that time. The mind is not a self-solving problem. It is one that is adding constantly to the creating of them. And the only thing that the mind can do is to suggest partial remedies for mighty mistakes. And the remedies yet generally are simply a rearrangement of the elements of the mistakes so that we are still in the same trouble we were in before. So to get the mind out of this squirrel cage in which it functions, we have to go to work on it. So, first of all, we relax. Now relax doesn't mean do nothing, but relax means that we stop breathing or feeding wrong information into the mind. We stop telling the mind that we want to be rich if, he, if it calls for a murder. We've got to tell the mind that we want what we want when we want it, and that this is wrong. Little by little, by reducing the temptations which we impose upon the mind, we can prevent a great many of the mistakes that arise from poor mentation. If we are willing to cut down the false ap appetites, then there will be less bad luck, so-called, hovering around us all the time. Out of a quiet mind, we can then say to the mind, think. And think with the aid of all the instruments that have been given to the mind to help it to think. And the individual whose mind is being considered must help the mind to do this. It must do it by presenting the mind a picture of the world thought. It must remind the mind of the tragedies of selfishness as represented all over the earth all the time. It must teach the mind the miseries of competition. It must also uh, lose or help the mind to lose the idea that the more it has, the happier it'll be. When in reality, as Buddha pointed out, the more we have, the more sleep we lose trying to take care of it all kinds of things by a very gentle thought can be caused to relax. And when we look back on a feud in the family, we can very quietly say to ourselves, let's review this feud. First of all, what good did it accomplish? And someone will say, well, uh, it accomplished some good. Uh, I uh, got a great deal of joy out of hating my neighbors. And I, I'm very happy to say I haven't spoken to my aunt for 25 years. Now, this is an achievement. And, and of course, it has devastated the aunt, who probably doesn't care and doesn't even know about it. Now, this is the way. If you start analyzing these things and breaking them down, you gradually come to realize that it, all of the negative, unhealthy attitudes that we have are bad bargains at best. So we didn't talk to the ant for 25 years. In our heart there was a wrangle, there was a hatred, there was a disturbance. And in the body that means there's an acidosis. You cannot hate somebody without the body suffering, regardless of how you do it. You cannot ignore a virtue without giving grounds to a vice. But most of all, you cannot continue to build a temperament around mistaken attitudes without ultimately shortening life, increasing sickness, and alienating yourself from the better things that make life valuable. Getting away from uh, all these false decisions and conclusions may have a tendency to cause the individual to drift a little toward religion. He may feel that his mind needs a little spiritual indoctrination. Well, that's very good as far as it goes, but the point here we must remember that nearly all religions are mind-produced. They are the result of thinking. 
They are a result of various pages in history, various races and nations, coming to their own conclusion concerning the nature of God and what God wants. So if we are going to turn to re religion for consolation, then it is very important to understand the nature of the religion that we are going to believe. And of course for Christians, the Sermon on the Mount is a very good foundation. But most Christians are not able to live by it. Why? Because the mind objects to it. Now this objection is very similar to the objection we have today where science for the most part glorifies atheism and uh, politics can hardly wait to get rid of all theological systems. This means that that part of society which is wrong wants to take over. The reason it wants to take over is that religion is a moralism that can interfere with ambitions. It can, ambi it can interfere with the determination to be rich. It can interfere with the absolute competition that dominates our thinking today. The fact is that when the wrong people want a thing, that's the thing the right people don't want. The individual who needs religious consolation to protect himself from materialism has to develop his own sense of values. But once he gets a strong enough sense of values, he is not likely to give in to the uh, hypnosis of prevailing customs and fashions. The only thing that materialism can dangle over his head as a promise is that when he's dead, he won't remember his mistakes. This is not exactly worthwhile living for, however. It's ne necessary to remember our mistakes even for the length of a lifetime while we're here. We only need to remember them long enough to correct them, and things start moving much better. So we go along and we find the mind sitting in all corners of this problem of living. It is pre present everywhere, trying to influence and dominate the lives of human beings. Yet we need it. But we need a mind that has been dedicated to a purpose. We need a mind that has accepted the responsibility of leadership over the problems of material existence. All these problems originate somewhere within the mind, and they have to be corrected by a, medical, a mental dedication. We have enough evidence at this moment to convince any court of law that it is impossible to break the rules of nature and be happy. Yet, uh, in a, we don't see nature anymore. Where well, we used to see nature with its roads of trees and its little dirt roads and its waterfalls, we see nothing now but condominiums, vast projects, vast um, metropolitan centers, great industrial complexes, and uh, nuclear energy centers. These things are what we see. The sky and the earth and the sun and the moon are now put in small parks where we have to go to have a picnic once in a while and we see them. We have gradually wind our, weaned ourselves away from the true world, the world of realities, and have taken on instead a fantastic jungle which we have created. Now the fact that we have created it does not make it good. And the fact that we have created it will not make it last. The mistakes that we make uh, through ignorance, we must correct through intelligence. The mind at the very beginning became more and more immersed in such problems as survival. It, it tried to build a philosophy around the small things of life that the primitive human being was able to contemplate. But little by little, it has created what we call civilization, which is a compound of uncivilized peoples. It is not something that we can be proud of. And it will never get better unless we do something about it. Now, of course, long spans of history probably don't intrigue the average person too much. He's not going to die of a broken heart about something that might happen 10,000 years from now 
or that a generation or a civilization will destroy itself sometime in the future. These are not the things that really lead the individual to uh, change his ways. Even where he knows that he is passing these mistakes on to his immediate children who may have to face the catastrophe, even this does this contemplation is not real enough to make any major change. Now, he thinks of a major change as getting out in front of the government and making them do something. But the major, major change for the average individual is simply his own attitude toward life. If he gets a straight view of life, he is becoming a free citizen of the universe. And the parent who can't change the political system can at the same time communicate to children the real facts of how to survive even in a catastrophe. The somewhere there has to be a hard score of realities or every major difficulty becomes a terminal mystery which is not reasonable or right. So we can uh, go on and we can go on to try and see what would happen if very quietly we begin to think it through. When we say, Joe's got a better job than I have, think it through and see whether it is as important as to make you jealous. Because if you're jealous long enough, the reward is likely to be ulcers. The, the, the man who has the job will never know you didn't like it. If you tell him so outside with very great firmness and make an enemy out of him, uh, he will probably decide he doesn't need your friendship that much anyway. But that isn't where it ends. The hard words you use continue in you. And first thing you know, these hard words become a gastrointestinal difficulty. The final immediate payment is not karma in a future life. The immediate payment is misery here and now. And this is what most people would try to minimize as much as possible. We'll always make enough mistakes to keep ourselves busy. We, will, we won't be allowed to just sit back, as the old folk used to say, and float to paradise on uh, flowery beds of ease. That isn't likely. But we can gradually recognize the practical side, the scientific side of our attitudes. We can realize that the effect does follow the cause, just as the wheel of the cart follows the foot of the oxen. We can realize that the stomach ache we have today could have been caused by a dozen mistakes we might have made yesterday or the day before, including gluttony, alcoholism, a hasty meal, a poor selection of dietetic materials, or just plain eating when in, a, when in a case of complete nervousness or anxiety. So we have to recognize that no matter what we do that is wrong, something is going to hurt or itch somewhere. And this itch is itself a valid statement of facts. We can do what we want to about most everything except the physical body. We can change almost anything except this physical structure in which we live and which is important to our existence in this world. We cannot fool it. We cannot deceive it. And we cannot cure it if we have sickened it beyond a certain degree. There are minor maladies that we can help. But if the cause has not been removed, they will be back. And wherever we find an individual whose mental integrities are not firm, he is a good candidate for some form of physical difficulty. No, it doesn't follow that we can be completely happy or live forever just because we keep the rules of life. But in keeping the rules of life, it's not just the food rules that we are concerned with. The, food, the rules of life that we see shadowed in the body uh, relationships are in all of the relationships. There is no way in which we can be unkind and gain anything but trouble. And the beautiful sense of success that we get when we have insulted another person will last for a minute, but the body chemistry will be injured maybe for months. Everything that is not pleasant, not constructive, not cooperative, and does not seek the good Everything that lacks these motives 
is subject to a suffering, a suffering equivalent to the attitude which they have held. Some of the suffering is physical, some will be emotional, some will, uh, will be mental. But where the individual has had a wrong attitude, he's going to pay for it. Now this sounds terrible, but it doesn't really mean it that way at all. Because the equipment that we have enables us to do it right. And all of nature, the universe, and the divine powers are concerned with our doing it right. What is wanted more than anything else is the human being who is able to become a permanent factor for good in the evolution of humanity. The development of humanity is a project carried on by powers much greater than ourselves. A great wave of life is moving through space and we are part of it. And uh, along the edge of this wave of space are stragglers of all kinds and there are also every type of we'll say vicious person, every type of troublemaker, every type of gangster somewhere in this motley group. This mass of motley group is slowing down, slowing down the normal growth of human society. The more misfits we have, the more cantankerous emotional uh, uh, intoxicants we have, the longer this problem continues. The lesson to be learned from a small attack in the, in the liver is applicable to the four and a half or five billion human beings that populate this planet. All of them have minds. And for the most part, these minds are not doing much good for them. Instead of these minds leading them to peace and integrity, the minds are leading them to further trouble. This funny's problem is how to get away with it. What do we do? Uh, in addition to these various rules and laws, what is it that can outwit the mind? We can say maybe the spirit could, but then we don't hear many uh, remarks coming from that level. Where and what is it that we can do to outwit the mind? Well, that which can outwit the mind, if we give it proper thought and time, that is the emotions. The emotions are far older than the mind. We had emotions long before we were able to think very much. But the emotions are a different type of thing. If emotions are hate, they will then enlist the aid of the mind to make that hate the most important thing in the world. This is what happens with wars. Wars are emotions stirred up to become mental hatreds. If, however, I'm on another angle of the matter, uh, the heart and the emotions are in some way enriched, ennobled, or made more significant to us, the result will be a great deal more peace and charity and insight. So we can say above selfishness there can occasionally rise a great heroism. And a great heroism is an individual rising above his own security to protect something greater than himself. And this is, in almost every case, love or compassion. The individual, therefore, who is able to strengthen his emotional realizations of life, who is, labeled, is, who is able to love honestly, is in a position to gain a great many benefits almost immediately. The difficulty, however, is that love plus intellect can be loaded with ulterior motives. Instead of the love being pure and true and right, the individual loves for gain, loves in some way because he hopes something better back from his affection. It's like the religionist who believes that he is building a church for the benefit of humanity, but he is also building a fame for himself. This type of thing is to be constantly watched. The, the mind, in the presence of an honorable and sincere affection, seldom raises much objection. But where the objections are raised is where the mind itself is still largely embedded in ulterior motives which the individual has not corrected or matured out of in his own temperament. 
So when we are working for some of these causes, we turn to religion for help. We turn to religion because we believe sincerely that this can give us a new value with which to transmute the mind. Very few religions have ever been successful as mental institutions. They have always appealed to the, to the graces of the spirit. They have appealed to the love of humanity and to the love of deity and to the recognition of the universal benevolence which governs all things and most of the all or possibly most of all the realization that our mistakes are due to our falling away from the practice of our religious convictions. So we can say love can do a great deal if it is sincere. Love can take a bad situation and correct it. But the correction must be honest. An individual with a stomach ache and had an argument with his daughter uh, cannot reconcile on the grounds that it will cure the stomach ache. This gets back into the old problem of barter and exchange, and that's not where we are concerned. Unless the motives involved in these things are above every ulterior motive, there is very little to them. But if a person's affections are so sincere that without ulterior motive they make a great sacrifice for another, or even a small sacrifice, but do, do this honestly, expecting nothing in return. Only under those conditions does this action have a definite therapeutic advantage. The more peaceful we become, the more gentle we are, the more we love those who are close to us, and in a large way those who need everywhere in the world, the more we get over the advantages to self and realize that we live in a world that must live and die together. If we must come to realize in the end that there can be no final good for us as persons unless we have helped to build a common good among all persons. And this is done by religion and it could be aided by education. But only if education and all these other factors are considerably renovated. The mind must recover from the delusion of ulterior motive. There must not be that tricky little thought hiding somewhere that what we are really doing is looking for something for ourselves even though we appear to be serving others. We must get over all ulterior motive for the mind building on ulterior motive continues to become a schema continues to perpetuate those very attitudes which are least likely to contribute to the public good. Now we have more contact with other people than we realize. There are, no, there are very few people who live for themselves alone. We are not just individuals in a sea of faces. We are all people. We are all involved in the same problems and every life meets and mingles with other persons during all the years of physical existence. It is therefore very important that each person learn to understand how to mingle with people, how to work with people, and not become involved in their prejudices and their opinions and their attitudes on a variety of subjects. We have to realize that a person with a religion different from our own can be perfectly sincere. And there is no reason for us to judge that person adversely unless his conduct is open to dispute. A fact that there is no such a thing as Christian honesty or dis Christian dishonesty should be, uh, this should be thought about. Because all honesty is honesty. Every religion teaches it. Every human being who is honorable teaches it and lives it. And when this becomes a clean living pattern we will have very much less crime or confusion in the world practically none but as long as we claim all these things as intellectual facts but never apply them to conduct or at least very seldom only in a great emergency as long as we do not live them the mental attitude weakens and the mind finally becomes converted to our own selfishness and will perpetuate it and continue it on and on through all the years of our lives. 
we don't want to make a mental delinquent out of our own minds. And we do it every day when we conspire and we cheat and we chisel for the various advantages we are seeking desperately to maintain. We also che che constantly carry this forward when we try to influence other people to change their ways primarily for our convenience. All these things are not uh, helpful. The mind is gradually being spoiled. And a spoiled mind is a very unpleasant thing. A spoiled mind is ir irritable, unreasonable, vindictive, belligerent, and almost any unpleasant synonym you can think of. Simply because it has been mistrained. And in society today we are sending forth into the world generations of young people in whom uh, vices are becoming innate. These young people have not been taught the values of life. They have been taught only how to get ahead at the cost of anything and everyone. They have not been taught any moral lesson about what happens to things. They haven't had enough in education in them to restrain from narcotics addiction. Yet they read in the paper, they see in the motion pictures, they observe everywhere the results of narcotic addiction. Yet they keep right on doing it. Why? Because in their mind, they are excusing or vindicating themselves in one of several ways. One way is that they don't care the cost, that's the way they feel right now. This is the important thing. Well, the same is true in national integrations. In wars, lots of people don't believe in much of anything except what they want right now, and that usually is to survive. The uh, narcotics addict also does these, sometimes does this because he is against society. He wishes to prove definitely that he is no part of a society he does not respect. This can lead to all kinds of crime, crimes which arise as a result of the terrorism of non-adjustment, incapable in of straight thinking. Then the narcotic problem again is highly profitable. The million, billions of dollars a year are taken from legitimate enterprise to take care of narcotics addiction. Now these people know this. There's no person probably high, uh, lower than the third or fourth grade who hasn't been come some way contacted. The uh, school uh, yards are now practically uh, centers for the distribution of narcotics. Why? How is it that young people with minds that are supposed to be growing up to become useful citizens being snared in a thing like this? Well, the reason it is is that the mind tolerates it. The mind that gets all kinds of attitude developments which make it accept this. The mind thinks it's wonderful to be clever, that to be different, to take chances, and most of all, to lose all sense of responsibility. Don't worry, do what you want to now. All this type of attitude ends in a tragedy. And in this case, the body itself goes with the rest. And most of these younger people will ultimately either find a remedy or else will kill themselves. So why does the mind do this to us? Why doesn't the mind see the Sermon on the Mount? Why doesn't the mind accept the Ten Commandments? Well, the reason why, largely, is the ulterior motive that is in ourselves. There is no evil spirit somewhere teaching us to be evil. The thing is that down in our hearts and hearts of hearts, a great many people simply want what they want. And the, and the way of getting it is immaterial. The main way is to have it. They feel certain that if they get what they want, they will have leisure, happiness, peace, tranquility, success, superiority, distinction, and power. And what they really get is the same six square feet that they always got. Now back to the earth from which they came. There is no way of winning that kind of a fight. But why fight? 
The emotions don't say so usually, unless they're badly corrupted. The body is screaming, don't do it. But the mind has found out how to argue these things until the individual surrenders. The mind uh, finally permits him to do what he secretly wanted to do for the re secret reasons that he wanted to do it. Almost every one of these young people has some kind of a discouragement against the facts of life that is leading them to this type of attitude. And yet they are doing nothing to correct the unhappy facts of life that are driving people to crime, narcotics, and alcoholism. They are, they are people who cannot adjust to the corruptions of the time unless they first demoralize themselves. So this goes on continuously and has been for a long time. The mind has to be taken over and when an individual makes a commitment to religion or to anything which he feels is necessary to his well-being, he's got to make a complete conviction of it. He's got to go to work on his own mind. He's got to use that side of his mind, which is his true mind, the divine mind in himself, and get away from this animal mind that is constantly contributing to his delinquency. The first thing the individual must do in censoring a thought is to decide whether that thought is right or wrong, basically. If it is wrong, reject it. If it is right, fight for it, even though it may take a great deal of energy, time, and sacrifice. But the fact remains, and has always been, as far as our civilization is concerned, the two minds are fighting each other. One mind is a mind of gratification. The other is a mind of edification. One says, do what you please. The other says, do what you should. And the world is divided now between these two approaches to the problems of existence. Unless we solve this as individuals, we will not be able to continue the way of life we want to become accustomed to. If we do not do something about these things, we will be mentally, emotionally, or physically sick. And uh, while many are not in a condition in which they are being treated for their problems, it's safe to say that a large percentage of the world's population of the, at the present time is neurotic, far more than those are under, that are under treatment. So the mind, the highest aspect of our mind, uh, what the Hindu calls the Arupa Manas, the divine mind, the mind of truth in ourselves, is forever fighting the mind of gratification. It is a struggle between spirit and body. It is between soul and the soulless. It is between the invisible cause and the visible compromised effect. So we each of us have this little fight on our hands. In many cases, it's not a very serious one. There are not great big things that we're doing wrong. But there should be a few, at least moderate-sized things that we're doing right. And doing right completely, because we believe in them, because we know they're right, and because we know that we must face the consequences if we don't. Philosophy, however, is not based upon a per perpetuation of punishment. It is a, actually a system of cultivation by which the individual recovers from the need of punishment by gradually overcoming his own mistakes. By doing it this way, the mind becomes the most powerful instrument for good that is imaginable. But until that time, it's going to be hovering around trying to convince us that we should compromise principles in order to have a little more fun now and dispatch later. This type of thinking has got to come more and more clearly into our consciousness. Well, folks, I think that's all for the morning. <laughs>